Indian hero of the Soviet Union, Rakesh Sharma, India's first and only spaceman. In the early 1980s, the Soviet Union approached the Indian Prime Minister Indira Gandhi with an offer to fly an Indian to their space station, Salyut 7. Why? To assert the supremacy of the Soviet communist way of life over American democracy. The Soviet's motivation was for India to align itself politically with the USSR, or at least prevent it from standing alongside the USA. India had collaborated with the USA since the early days of the space race. The first rocket launched from India into space in 1963 came from NASA. In 1975, some of the poorest people on the planet were the first to enjoy satellite television. The television signals were beamed to Indian villages by an American satellite. Rakesh Sharma was the 128th representative of humanity to go into space. Almost three decades later, he remains the only Indian national with experience of spaceflight. In this extended interview, Rakesh Sharma talks about his childhood passion for flying, the cosmonaut selection process, base flight training in Star City, return from his eight days in space and its aftermath. So, with such a rich career, um, test pilot, uh, wing commander, cosmonaut, how should I address you? Rakesh is just fine. <laughs> to what age did you get involved in flying? Um, when I was a kid, the vampires just made their entry into the Indian airspace and uh, I was fascinated by these <clears throat> machines flying around and making this whistling sound and so so that captivated my imagination and then I had a had a relative um, who had joined the Air Force and he uh, took me uh, along with him at times uh, to the air base and uh, made me sit in the aircraft and I was all of five or six and uh, and uh, I just I just got to, to my mother tells me that uh, when I was a kid, I used to uh, run down the road with my arms outstretched, uh, whistling, uh, imitating the sound of a jet. So we're talking about the mid-50s. Whereabouts in India is this then? Uh, this is in Hyderabad. I was raised in Hyderabad, although I was born in Patiala. I was, I was raised in Hyderabad. My father got posted to Hyderabad. And uh, that's where I did all my education. And you say your father was posted, so he was uh, part of the military? No, no, he was, he was with Punjab National Bank. Right. Yes. I started flying first with the uh, HT2, it was a propeller tail wheel aeroplane. And, uh, and uh, <clears throat> did about 40 hours on that. Right. After which moved to the more powerful, again, propeller driven single engine uh, Texan or the... Uh, Harvard, as it was called, right. T6G. Uh -huh. uh, did about 75 hours on that. And uh, then the Vampire, which was the advanced stage. So the flying training took a year and a half. And uh, at the end of it, uh, got our commission and won right. those wings and uh, got commissioned into the Indian Air Force. And you mentioned the encouragement, the first encouragement you received was from a family member who joined the Air Force. So you're following his footsteps? Um, <clears throat> not consciously, but uh, yes, uh, he was the one who, who took me along with him and made me sit in the cockpit of, of the vampire and stuff. And, and um, it, it, it just, uh, the feeling just kept getting stronger mm -hmm. uh, that this is where I want to be. And, uh, and of course, that was traumatic. We lost him about um, three months after he got commissioned in, a, in an accident in a vampire. And uh, after I got commissioned, uh, fortunately, the Indian Air Force wanted to try an experiment of catching him young. So, <laughs> so we were the lot 
who were exposed to uh, the spanking new supersonic fighter which the Indian Air Force had got and um, and we converted on to the MiG-21 and uh, 50 hours later I found myself uh, in a frontline squadron um, and uh, two months later I found that I was uh, flying the war and uh, before my 23rd birthday I had flown 21 operational missions in a MiG-21 so everything's happened very early in my life and well I've led a charmed life. 21 and, operational flights there must have been uh, some um, tight moments. Um, not really, and the reason for that is that uh, I was in this uh, air defense role mm -hmm. and our job was essentially to do offensive sweeps mm -hmm. on the border and uh, <clears throat> paint on uh, the enemy radar and hope mm -hmm. that they would send mm -hmm. uh, their fighters to engage with us and, and, and that's when the fun was supposed to start except that nobody came. Uh, reason being that uh, um, uh, this war was being fought on two fronts. Right. And east and West Pakistan. East and West. And, and Pakistan uh, wasn't very sure how long it's going to carry on. So they were conserving their resources. Yeah, so it's, it's quite interesting. A lot of the astronauts and cosmonauts, and indeed Yuri Gagarin, spent his early days as a Soviet Union Air Force pilot patrolling the skies of northern parts of the uh, Soviet Union. There must be some natural development of senses and getting to grips with the unknown, which is good training for future space flight. Uh, can you see anything in that period? In, in I would say, I would say it is the development <clears throat> of a state of mind mm. and uh, your approach and your attitude and for that more than your air force training i think it's it's your test flying career which prepares you for that because you deal with the unknown very many more more number of times mm. uh, than you would as a as a squadron pilot yes. because and in any case Many others have done it before you. I mean, I can imagine what Gagarin must have felt. Right. But I was the 128th guy to go up into space, so I knew <laughs> it's doable. <laughs> well, and then I was chosen to to upgrade and and uh, become an experimental test pilot, which then qualified me to test designs off the drawing board. Ah, I see. Right. Yeah. So, um, so then I became an experimental test pilot mm -hmm. and. Uh, as luck would have it, um, when the space flight thingy happened, mm -hmm. uh, the Russians uh, asked uh, for um, the aspirants to be uh, chosen from among test pilots. And that's how it happened. I think it was when Yuri Gagarin came to India. Were you at that time aware uh, that Yuri Gagarin was in India and were you aware of what he, was, he had done? Well, uh, quite frankly, no. Uh, in the sense, I have a vague recollection, but I, I think he just visited Delhi and stuff. And right, yeah. So, uh, it, it is, I, I do not recall any uh, felicitation where I was living, but uh, uh, that was big news. I mean, all of us uh, were absolutely fascinated by this mm -hmm. space flight. It was the very first time it had happened and, uh, and uh, so much was written about it that um, like everybody else of my generation um, lapped up every written word and uh, followed every space flight thereafter whether the Americans or the Russians. And when you say the Air Force uh, was looking for potential pilots to engage with the Soviet Union for a space flight, um, is it something that you heard about or was it in, published in a newspaper or a local internal uh, paper? Well, it was all, all very hush-hush <laughs> it was at that time because uh, yeah. <coughs> um, it was decided that the news uh, will be broken by Mrs. Gandhi on her visit to Moscow when she specifically visits Star City right. and that's when the world would know that 
India is uh, sending uh, uh, a spaceman up with the Soviets. So therefore, you know, it was all hush hush. The whole selection process um, it was code named, and uh, we also got to know just before the medical started what it was all about. Uh, but before that, we were just asked to volunteer for something which was extraordinary and stuff. So we volunteered. I see. So you actually didn't know yeah, space yeah, flight. Yeah. You said it was codenamed. Do you remember what the codename was? Project Pavan. Pavan now. Yes. See. Project Pavan. Yeah. And in the was... services, we are a very apolitical lot and we don't know what goes on behind. But I, I guess at that point, we were uh, um, in the Russian bear hug, uh, <laughs> geopolitically speaking. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, <clears throat> uh, the Soviet Union would have liked the world to know that, that India is a, one of its satellites, which uh, we never really uh, subscribed to That's the, right. the notion. It always right remained non aligned. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so they were after uh, Mrs. Gandhi to, to, to agree to a space flight. And this was the regulation to, uh, I mean, the Cuban is gone and the Hungarian is gone. And I see. The, Polish has gone, and so it was part of the intercosmos program, <clears throat> ostensibly uh, cooperative ventures between friendly nations and stuff. And uh, so Mrs. Gandhi asked uh, Isro, and Isro said, "We are not interested because we don't. We want to remain focused on our satellite program, and the satellite program has got socio-economic benefits. So, you know, we don't want to." Be distracted from that and they said we are not interested so it kind of quietened down till the Soviets again said hey you know so that is when Mrs. Gandhi offered it to the Air Force and the Air Force grabbed it. Mm -hmm. I'm told that uh, they first did um, went through the annual confidential reports of some 250 odd I see. Right. Um, pilots and uh, shortlisted them. Then from amongst them, <clears throat> they got hold of some fire pilots and got them down to 50. And uh -huh. then from there, another shortlist of test pilots. And, and then the medical started and the numbers kept getting whittled down at, after each phase. Uh -huh. and, and the final, then uh, the Russians came down to India to repeat some of the tests, mm -hmm. medical tests. Right. Then we didn't have the equipment, uh -huh. medical equipment for some specific tests. So, uh, what was it? Four of us were flown to Moscow. Right. We did those tests there, uh -huh. and then finally two of us remained. Space flight training. Space flight training. All of it happened at Star City. Right. All of it. Because at that time there wasn't any facilities, any infrastructure for that kind there of. There still isn't. In India, for. Human space flight. And how long was that training? How long were you in Star City for? 18 months. More importantly, two winters. <laughs> <laughs> so they're pretty harsh then, the winters. Yeah. Yeah. yeah well, we were told that we Indians have brought a lot of warmth, and uh, the two winters we were there, uh, the mercury never dropped below minus 30. <laughs> so, <laughs> for somebody who's from India, it must have been particularly tough. It was, it was. And then um, the, the whole culture there was to walk. Mm -hmm. So we used to leave uh, our rooms in the morning when it was dark. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and uh, trudge. Uh, we used to walk some seven to eight kilometers, uh, mm -hmm. reminiscent of Dr. Zhivago's visuals. You know? Really? Yeah, plodding through the snow. But everybody would walk. Uh, yeah. the, 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 the faculty, absolutely everybody would walk. Yeah. And, uh, and that's well, then walk for lunch and get back and walk again to classes, different uh -huh. places, yes. Now, in the training, um, you obviously done a lot of uh, flight training. What special training was involved for you in preparation for your space flight? There was a lot of ground uh, classes, mm -hmm. uh, space flight dynamics, um, you know, essentially differences between a craft, 
uh, sterility and control uh, in an aircraft which is within the medium of the atmosphere right. and uh, a spacecraft which is outside of it. Right. So different uh, physical laws are in operation. <clears throat> so that plus um, uh, learning about the star sky, the environment you'll be operating in right. and uh, mm -hmm. uh, survival training, a lot of simulator work, procedures training. Uh -huh. so. So, that's, that's so microgravity experience as well? Yeah, microgravity experience was given in an IL-76 aeroplane. <clears throat> it was specially stressed and padded from the inside. Mm -hmm. And the aircraft would uh, do a pre-programmed maneuver mm -hmm. where it would gather speed and then they would stick it up mm -hmm. 45 degrees. Mm -hmm. And as the speed would wash out, the autopilot would bunt the aeroplane kind of a capillary maneuver and while it is describing that part of the arc uh, it was a controlled pitch forward right. so that conditions of zero gravity existed within the cabin mm -hmm. for about 25 seconds or so. Now not everybody, it's a bit like uh, uh, traveling on the sea, some people get seasickness. Um, what was your first experience of weightlessness in this test environment? You you weren't uncomfortable with it. Oh no, it was it was fun. You felt like Superman. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is that um, twenty five seconds is a very short time mm. slice for uh, physiological changes to work. Of One of the other things you must have uh, inc must have been included in the training is the Russian language. Yeah, in fact, that was the most difficult part of the training because uh, we didn't know Russian and. Uh, the first three months were devoted primarily to the right. learning of the language and yeah, yeah that was tough, that was really tough. Do you remember any of that? Yeah. Oh yeah, I guess yeah. it's, yeah. yeah I do remember, I do remember. I can make myself understood even today. Yeah. Speaking in English is exquisite, excellent and bearing in mind that uh, uh, I take it you speak Hindi, you must speak Punjabi. some Punjabi as well. So that's at least four languages. <laughs> Others as well throughout your career you must have picked up? Well, I used to. Yeah, I've learned a bit of French in school and stuff. <laughs> By this time, in the early 1980s, when you were at Star City doing your training for your mission, you must have met uh, some of the key figures from the Soviet space um, history anyway. Kareliev and Gagarin had died, but uh, you must have met other people like Alexei Leonov? Yes, of course. Oh. Yes, and that was uh, <laughs> quite something. Right. Alexei Leonov was there, Shatalov was there. Um, used to see Valentina Tereshkova walking around. Right. <laughs> used to see, in fact, um, that samovar yeah. has been presented to me by Valentina Tereshkova. That bring me to this camera. <laughs> this unit. Yeah. I'll just pass it to you, sir. It's a traditional receptacle in which uh, tea is made. Uh -huh. So, this was presented to me personally by yeah. Valentina Tereshkova. She's a very, very charming lady. Yeah. Moment of launch is always um, a spectacular, uh, fantastic experience, but it must also have been a scary one. Do you remember uh, how the launch was for you? Yeah, um, it was... Uh, the unknowing part was that you you couldn't see outside. Right. So, a very important uh, visual input was missing. and uh, for, an air, uh, for a test pilot. Yeah, pilot. I mean, it's, <laughs> so, so it's, it's like, you know, you're blind and... Yeah. And you know, there's a whole lot happening 13 stories down, and uh, there's noise, and then there's a heck of a lot of vibration, and uh, and then there's a bit of swaying, and then you're off, and then the thing is that you're sitting 13 stories up, close to that needle structure, which is which is supposed to extract you and save you in the event of a mishap at, 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 on the launch pad. And uh, the flight control system is, is fighting to maintain a vertical direction. Mm -hmm. And so slight inputs which are given at that end get amplified ah, 13 stories above. So, so you, 
you don't want to make the job any more difficult for the flight control system. So you are like frozen in your seat, not, not wanting to move at all and, <laughs> and cause a weight shift. Yeah. So it's quite a, a powerful rocket. It's very tried and tested technology. But the fact that you're a, a pilot and you're used to controlling, uh, here the acceleration and the forces are so high that it has to be automated quite a lot. Do you feel somewhat powerless when automation is in control at the launch phase? Yeah, I mean, no pilot likes to be ballast sweet, right? <laughs> uh, no pilot likes that, but, but that's the nature of the beast and that's how it's done. Yeah. So you, you launch about <coughs> 10 minutes to get into orbit and how long then after that did you actually join up with the Soviet space station, the Soyuz? Yeah, it takes, takes quite a few hours and that is essentially to conserve uh, energy. Right. <clears throat> what happens is that um, because you're at a lower orbit, mm -hmm. you know, you are moving relatively faster than the right. uh, yeah. laboratory which is at a higher orbit right. so right. the phase angle uh, with each orbit reduces right. till you kind of come in line uh -huh. and, and then uh, you expend energy to close the gap and go ahead and do and dock environment control system mm -hmm. um, and all the instrumentation connected with it mm -hmm. That was my responsibility, right. to monitor and intervene and, in case of a problem. And all this is happening in um, a context where you've got instruments which are space related rather than aviation. All of them will have been labelled in Russian. You've got people speaking to you on the radio in Russian. Your colleagues sitting next to you speaking in Russian. It's quite an, an, an unusual environment. It is, it is, and uh, yeah. I, quite frankly, um, what happens is that you feel you're not fully immersed mm -hmm. as you should be. This is your uh, first time when you were in microgravity for an extended period of time. You got used to it fairly quickly? Oh yes, yeah. oh yes. It was, uh, changes did take place, of course. Uh, mm -hmm. um, you know, the tongue swells up. Oh, I see. Yeah, there's a lot of a collection of blood in the upper extremities. Uh -huh. So your face swells up. You feel feverish. <clears throat> and uh, if you uh, have that tendency, uh -huh. uh, that's when space sickness hits you. Because your role as research cosmonaut what did that entail for the eight days that you were in Earth orbit? What sort of things were you doing? What, well, essentially, they were experiments which were designed by the Indian scientists and uh, <clears throat> utilizing uh, instruments which were designed and manufactured by the Indian side. Mm -hmm. uh, we used the multispectral camera which was on board mm -hmm. the Salyut to photograph the Indian landmass. Um, uh, you said you're taking some pictures of the Indian landmass, and from 200 uh, kilometers up, it must, it must have looked really good. Um, are any of those pictures publicly available I, that you took? You, you yeah, know? those pictures uh, later on became the database for our own remote sensing program. Because when our satellites went up, uh -huh. you know you you knew what it looked like in 84 and, and whether it's erosion, whether it is right. uh, say the glacial shifts in the Himalaya right. and you know so so they, it became a database. Uh, so uh, after nearly eight days uh, it's time for you to come back. Um, I guess uh, it's pretty standard routine that um, Salyut and Soyuz had been practicing and it was a routine departure for you and landing back at Earth? Yeah, uh, it, was, it was routine and uh, again we went into quarantine basically for, for the medics to, right. to do their stuff mm -hmm. and, then, and then life changed <laughs> and 
among long uh, <coughs> uh, events of speeches and ribbon cutting and that kind of stuff. And, that's it. Did, and did you go back to India? Did you have um, training for that? Did you uh, walk into it easily? Did you find it uh, difficult? Hated it. The, the, the reaction, in my opinion, was so disproportionate to the event. And that's what I, I, I felt. And uh, I, was, I was amused, I was irritated, I was... Uh, but I was kind of trapped in it and I, I knew it had to be done. That was, <clears throat> I did not believe that it was fair on my part to burst somebody else's bubble. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's how they viewed the whole event. Right. Whereas uh, I viewed it as, uh, as, uh, as a professional outing, <laughs> something which I was detailed to do and, and I, I, I finished it and I'm done, done with it and this was I was concerned right. I wanted okay. to get back to my old job. Right. Right. When you returned the Soviet Union awarded you a medal uh, something that um, Soviet Union is uh, Hero of the Soviet Union Yeah. and um, Order of the Lenin and Order of the Lenin and did they do that with all the foreign uh, cosmos yes. the flu? Yes, it was a package deal, part of the regulation tour. I <laughs> see. Yes. And as far as I'm aware, you're the only Indian with that particular award. That's right. Is that right? That's yeah. right. So, and, and it's a, a, an award that certainly all the early Vostok cosmonauts from Gagarin onwards got. Um, so it's quite a special award. Um, how, what kind of awards did you get here in, the, here in India? In India, well, the Ashok Chakra, which was... Um, that's the parchment which goes along with it. It's the <coughs> highest uh, gallantry award. Um, the Ashok Chakra is the equivalent of the Paramvir Chakra, except that the Ashok Chakra is at the same level, not in the face of the enemy. Ah, so that's the right. difference. Right. And how do you feel about such awards, the Ashok Chakra and Hero of the Soviet Union? I don't want to sound ungrateful, but it's it's the done thing, you know. Mm. Just part of the package, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, you guys have, I won't say it was a cakewalk. Right. Yeah, It'd probably be different. I probably would change my opinion had I been more fulfilled, had I been a career astronaut. Right. It's just that we don't have a manned space program. Right. And it's just something, as you say, it's part of your professional... Yeah, so I, I looked at it as, 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 as an event, mm -hmm. you know, something which was given to me and I did it and I, I want to do it. Yes. Okay, one thing I'm going to speak to you about, well, it's a quote that always associated with, always pops up when, you speak, when your space flight comes up. You can guess probably what it was. But you know when Apollo 11 astronauts, Buzz Aldrin and... Armstrong were on, on the surface of the moon, they got a call from their president, Nixon. When you were in Earth orbit, you got a call from the Indian Prime Minister, Indira Gandhi, and she asked you a question. She said, se Bharat kesa diste? And you replied, Sare jahan se achha. Do you get somewhat lift that that's in many ways characterizes your flight? It's the bit quote that often comes up. Um, it, there's a lot more to it than just that. What well, that yes, that somehow has stayed in in uh, <clears throat> in the public's imagination, and in fact, it's now become synonymous with my name for some reason. I mean, they say Rakesh Sharma, oh, Sarah you know, it's like that. <laughs> it's by association. <laughs> and Sarah Jahanse Acha, when I was a student. Mm -hmm was the de facto number two national anthem. Right. Yeah. Uh, Muhammad Iqbal and, and it's, the words are so meaningful and it has always been one of my favorite songs. Right. And it somehow just came, came out. And it, so it wasn't rehearsed then? This? Oh, no, no, of course no. not. No, it yeah. wasn't rehearsed. Yeah. <laughs> so, it wasn't rehearsed. The, there were some plans for 
an Indian astronaut to go up with the Americans on the space shuttle program. Um, that never happened, did it? Yeah, so um, with the Americans it goes like this, that uh, if you're wanting the shuttle to launch one of your satellites, mm -hmm. then your payload specialist gets to ride on that flight. Right. So that's how right. one of ISRO's uh, scientists mm -hmm. was supposed to have been on that flight, but before this launch took place, mm -hmm. the Challenger disaster happened. And the entire uh, program, mm -hmm. the uh, shuttle program, mm -hmm. went on the skids. Mm -hmm. And till the inquiry was yeah. not completed, the flights were scrapped. In fact, I would say that Ravi should have gone. Right. And this is Ravi Malhotra, who was your Ravish, backup yeah, for your Ravish flight. Ravi Malhotra, yeah. And, and what uh, did uh, Ravi go on to do, do anything uh, in terms of space well, flight? Ravi was a test pilot just like I was and uh, we went back to our jobs. Right. That's it. Ravi then commanded a station and stuff and then he retired as an air commodore. Right. And do you keep in touch with him? Oh yes. Yeah. So oh, yes. my flight per se uh, was, um, was uh, I would put it that uh, it wasn't too much about science, it was mm. about politics. Right. And once the political aims were realized, yeah. um, <clears throat> um, there was no follow-up, whereas we should have. Mm. Like the French, <laughs> the French, the backup flew then uh, with the Russians, uh, and a couple of years later, uh, other French cosmonauts flew, so that 10 years down the line, by the time the uh, uh, International Space Station was on, the French had a core group of uh, its own astronauts. Right. And this is something which we, we should have done. Mm -hmm. and, uh, the other common question that arises when we discuss space and India, India still um, has a problem, huge problem of poverty and illiteracy and very poor and weak infrastructure. Shouldn't we be spending money on that rather than the space program? I think it's all a question of how well do you spend your money. Mm -hmm. Poverty is there not because we don't have the solutions for it, but because we are a corrupt nation and there's resources leak on their way. It doesn't, you do not get your bang for your buck because of corruption. I think India has a lot, lot to offer to the world community and, and I am not a believer in, uh, <clears throat> in every country rediscovering the wheel. Mm -hmm. I do not subscribe to every country developing its own human space program. I mean, I would say the time has come to start collaborating, mm -hmm. you know, because there's so much of work left to be done outside. Tomorrow you're going to colonize the moon, you're going to explore Mars. Mm -hmm. It's beyond the ken of any one nation. And, it, and if every nation is going to go that route, we are going to plunder the meager resources we have on planet Earth. I mean, you know, nothing is free. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so it's time to collaborate. And in any case, when you go and inhabit Mars or beyond that, are you going to go there as Indians or Chinese or Americans? I mean, you're going for as people from planet Earth. So let's let's start working towards a common identity. And uh, otherwise, you will be setting up another Antarctica on the moon. I'm going to do my mining in this area. You do your mining in that area. Uh, you will only be moving conflict out of planet Earth to outer space without addressing the core issues which is inequitable distribution of resources.